Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you renowned Reagan scholar, Dr. Stephen Hayward, a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute, a senior resident scholar at the Institute of Governmental Studies at UC Berkeley, and a visiting lecturer at Bolt Hall Law School. He was previously the Ronald Reagan Distinguished Visiting Professor at Pepperdine University's Graduate School of Public Policy. Dr. Hayward frequently writes for PowerLineBlog.com and is the author of six books, including a two-volume chronicle of Ronald Reagan. They're called The Age of Reagan, The Fall of the Old Liberal Order, 1964-1980, and The Age of Reagan, The Conservative Counter-Revolution, 1980-1989. During today's conversation, Dr. Hayward discusses the state of the Reagan movement today. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program with Stephen Hayward and Reagan Institute Director Roger Zakheim. Dr. Stephen Hayward, thank you for coming on this show. Welcome. Oh, I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm sorry it's taken so long, but you know, our schedules have been strange, right? So well, we... of course, and you've been performing your civic duty of, uh, you know, jury service here. <laughs> well, yeah, that was quite a thing. Uh, I, I think I'll stick to voting as far as, far as my civic duty goes. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you'll, you know, not too long here, you'll have opportunity to exercise that uh, civic responsibility as well. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, but it's a thrill to have you on Reaganism and and uh, the show because, you know, uh, I don't know if your or your children or family are aware that you are a celebrity, certainly in the world of Reagan with your uh, two volume biography, The Age of Reagan. Uh, do people come over to you and ask for your autograph? Uh, no, that hasn't happened, although I have actually been recognized in an airport a couple of times with my kids along with me, which always astonishes me and embarrasses them. So. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, you know, as a, as a, as a parent as well, like having your children uh, be embarrassed by you is, you know, it's just par for the course, right? Yes. Um, but, but that volume or volumes, I should say, uh, it's truly remarkable. Um, and uh, as I mentioned uh, before we started that on our, on this show, we always ask people what their favorite Reagan book is and consistently the age of Reagan uh, is mentioned as their favorite Reagan book. Talk a little bit about the work, you know, time uh, that went into producing a 1,500-page biography of, of President Reagan. Yeah, well, it, uh, it took me 10 years from wire to wire, or maybe a little longer. I was doing other things, too, because I was working at the American Enterprise Institute and, and you know, had a whole portfolio there. Uh, but it was great fun. I was actually sorry when it ended. I was having so much fun doing it. It's such an endlessly fascinating subject, Ronald Reagan is. Uh, it's worth mentioning, I guess, how I got into it. I had intended yeah. to write a one-volume book, a you know, standard account, and two things happened. First of all, the original idea for it way back in the mid-1990s came after I went to a small dinner with Edmund Morris, whose book, Violet Cows, was a great disappointment, to put mm -hmm. it mildly. And at the time, listening to him, I thought, he's going to produce a book that's going to be too narrowly focused on Reagan's personality, which it really was. And I thought, and nobody else in the mid 90s really was working much on Reagan. Um, and I thought there's going to be a need for and large room for a book that has what I call the outside story. In other words, a narrative that put Reagan in a broader political context. And I think that's how he's best understood as a statesman. And then when more, I was, you know, halfway done uh, with the first draft when Morris's book came out, and it turned out to be even narrower and more bizarre than we thought. Right. And there's things he, he's completely skipped over lots of episodes in Reagan's political story. So suddenly my one volume to tell the story fully became two volumes, which I was most grateful for the publisher for allowing me to do. Because that's very rare these days to have two volume uh, treatments. Yeah. Of anything. Um, so that's but how I did it. And uh, it made the whole project a lot longer and bigger than I had originally conceived. But 
I'm kind of glad it did because I had way too much fun. No, well, it, you know, and it's, and it continues to be of interest. Um, you know, it's interesting the distinction between the internal and the external, right? And, and, uh, you read, uh, my, my understanding is that, you know, President Reagan selected Morris on the basis of his biography of, of TR, Theodore Roosevelt, which reflecting on that, as you say it now, really is about kind of the internal side of Theodore Roosevelt and less kind of robustly about his presidency or his rise in the kind of the external side. Right. Is that Last true? Week, Would you say that's true in terms of the right. treatment of TR? Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, Morris's bio, uh, uh, more, uh, Roosevelt biography ended up being three volumes, but he'd only finished the first one at the time that he met the Reagans and he interrupted his Theodore Roosevelt work to, follow, to write the Reagan book. And the first volume was really about, uh, you know, Roosevelt the rancher and the Westerner and the naturalist. And Morris is a very gifted stylist, but he doesn't have much um, uh, aptitude in or interest in American politics. You know, he's a, what, a Commonwealth when he was born in right. Kenya and worked in advertising. And, and actually his Roosevelt books are great reading, uh, but they're not very good on Roosevelt's political thought. Uh, and for that, you got to read different books. And so I really want to try and get at, uh, you know, the context of Reagan and also Reagan's political thought and ideas. And a lot of books aren't very good at that, I think. Yeah. And, and of course, you build the first volume was builds up to the Reagan presidency, which, you know, I think what came out of, of the Morris biography, you know, Dutch, um, was kind of reinforcing views about Reagan, which your biographies and then uh, subsequent work by uh, the Andersons and, and Kyron Skinner really demonstrated, hey, that there's a lot of, of kind of history before uh, Reagan became president uh, and, you know, letters in his own hand and other pieces. I mean, the, the co collection of their work and your work really kind of countered that, that view. You know, one of the things that, uh, that I realized when I started getting into the documents and really looking closely at the Reagan story is that I mean, not only were most of the cliches told about him wrong, that, you know, that he was dumb or that he was a creature of his staff or that he was lazy, but quite the contrary, that he actually arrived at the White House as one of the best prepared incoming presidents we've ever had. But so much went on behind the scenes. And one of the interesting things about Reagan is, uh, you know, all politicians, especially at the highest level, they have big egos. He had one, too. But he also uh, had a certain amount of modesty. Uh, he understood that he couldn't do things alone. He also understood that it's not a good look for politicians to be boastful uh, or to be, uh, and so he never tried to be the smartest guy in the room. Uh, he was a very secure person. And so that's one reason why he was able to do that. He was also very disciplined. I think that's huh. one contrast with the current president, obviously. Well, we're, we're going to get into that a little bit as well. <laughs> right. Reagan was very disciplined, uh, and and by the way, that discipline, part of the discipline was making it look casual, right? He liked to joke that, uh, you know, people say hard work never killed anyone, but I say, why take chances? <laughs> and <laughs> there was a reason for that. I mean, I'll just say that briefly, is uh, one of the things Reagan understood, but never communicated uh, directly, is that the previous four presidents have all been thought to have been failures or have been overmatched by the job. And Reagan consciously thought, and you have to look hard to see this in, in, in you know, letters and things that he said uh, privately to people, but he understood that it would be better for the country if he conveyed to the country that there, no matter how bad things are or what may be going wrong, their president and their government had things in hand. So he worked very hard to convey that uh, sense of confidence in himself and in the country. And that's, uh, like I say, that took some discipline and insight. That was not obvious, certainly to his critics, but even to many of his friends. Yeah, I mean, the combination of humility he described and the optimism and the positive outlook is, is certainly unique to, to his brand. Um, you know, I wonder if, if, if the humility side, and I think you wrote this in the recent piece in the in Claremont Review of Books, uh, was tied to the generation in which he grew up. And it's part of the greatest generation ethos. I mean, is that right? Oh, I think that's absolutely right. You know, um, I don't know, I remember seeing, the t I, mean, I was alive at the time, I remember seeing Reagan sitting down with TV interviews for 60 Minutes or Barbara Walters, and you know, his generation was not introspective, or to the extent that he was introspective, because he was a spiritual man, but they're, you know, the World War II generation were much more private people. They didn't bear their souls in public. And that all changed with the baby boomers. <laughs> it were terrible, <laughs> point, right? Uh, so yeah, he's uh, I wouldn't say he's a throwback. He was I think Bob Dole was was similar in a lot of ways and you know similar generation and whatnot. 
Uh, and I think that's a generational difference. Uh, Reagan was, uh, we now say, a throwback to that older, quieter generation that didn't think they had to share all their emotions in public. What's remarkable about it is this, he came from the world of entertainment and, and, and Hollywood, and yet uh, still he maintained that, that, that kind of characteristic that you just described of, of the greatest generation, Bob Dole, I put you know, George H.W. Bush in that category as well as, as so many others. Um, you know, in terms of the, the policy um, of the Reagan administration and, pre and, and the presidency, and, you know, you, you, you praise President Reagan for, you know, delivering the end of the Cold War and, and confronting the Soviet Union. Uh, we'll get to, in a minute, some of the places where you, you criticize policies. What about the character? So much of the discussion today is the character of the presidency. How does that um, kind of where do you where do you rack and stack uh, that role of just uh, being someone who's kind of standing above it and bringing the country along? Um, is that, you know, when you're grading presidents as an historian, where does that reside in, in the ranking above or below or aside uh, kind of policy achievements? Oh, that, that's a huge thing. Uh, again, to build on that current point about how Reagan's four predecessors are all thought to have been failures to one extent. When he took office, and I have a long, several pages about this in the second volume, the conventional wisdom across the political spectrum, especially among intellectuals and historians and political scientists, is that the presidency itself was now too big a job. No one could succeed in the right. office. Uh, there were idea, uh, proposals that the office ought to be reconfigured, the Constitution should be changed. And after about six, seven years of Reagan in office, all that talk disappeared and has never come back. And there were even people, even again, some liberals and critics of Reagan who said that's his greatest achievement. He showed that you can, uh, you can govern successfully and maintain public support. And all this talk about it, the presidency being an obsolete institution disappeared. And you know, we've now seen uh, something that we haven't seen since the 1820s, 1830s. We've just finished with Obama uh, three two-term presidencies in a row. And for a while there in the 60s and 70s, it looked like we were never going to see that again. Unheard of. And we'll see what happens. We may get, if we get a fourth one, if, if President Trump is reelected, I think that will be unprecedented. We've never in our history had four two term complete presidencies in a row. And, 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 and you're focusing on, you know, a, a two term presidencies as, as a reflection of the fact that the office is, does not have to be greater than one person. In other words, the person can carry it in, in some ways you know, uh, notions of the unitary executive, the idea that the president sits above and, and, and this is the height of the power of the presidency in the history of our republic. Uh, is that related to the point you're making? Uh, yeah, well, I think so. I mean, I don't know. Uh, on the one hand, I tend to side with the critics who think that uh, the American people have placed too much weight on the presidency. This goes way before Reagan. Uh, it's, it really starts as far back as Woodrow Wilson or Theodore Roosevelt, but we've now inflated the presidency. Sure. And uh, uh, people in both parties, I think it's harder for Democrats and liberals because they tend to overpromise, but, but candidates in both parties uh, tend to present themselves as someone who can solve all of our problems. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say, um, here's my platform on COVID. We're going to leave it to the states because it's not a federal responsibility. It's just not going to work. Well, there's that. And then uh, sometimes presidents even go so far as to, you know, uh, promise to heal the holes in your soul. I mean, Lyndon Johnson even did that to some extent, as ridiculous as that sounds coming from someone like him. Uh, and, it, it, you know, but even even the problem of overpromising is distant from the fact that we do have a constitutional government with three right. branches of government. There's this thing called Congress. Right. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, it's uh, that a president can succeed at all in getting reelected and maintaining public support these days is nothing short of miraculous sometimes, I think. So let, let's talk a little about the policy uh, and your treatment of President Reagan, both in, in, in uh, the age of Reagan, but also most recently in, in your great piece in the Claremont Review of Books called The Ronald and the Donald, uh, reviewing H.W. Brand's book and, 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 and others as well. Um, on Besides the Cold War, but you talk about kind of the places where Reagan fell short and, and immigration uh, was one that you highlight. Uh, and of course, uh, federal spending and kind of entitlement reform as well. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, the misunderstandings people have of what President Reagan wanted and sought to achieve with respect to immigration. And then your own view in terms of uh, perhaps it, it, 
it not uh, not being a credit or, or in some ways, you know, a, a, a part of his administration that really failed to achieve? Well, I think, first of all, whenever you look back on something that nowadays roils our politics, it's not necessarily or entirely fair to impose today's perception of a problem on 34 years ago, which is when the immigration bill passed. It was a much less severe, I mean, it was an issue, but it was not the huge issue it's become today. The other thing that's interesting, if you go back 35, 40 years ago, is you had a lot of Democrats who were for immigration restrictions and a lot of Republicans who were pro-immigration to various degrees, some for economic, some for old fashioned melting pot reasons, right? We take people from all over the world and make them Americans. Uh, that, that was very much thing. President Reagan's language. Absolutely, that's right. He, uh, he spoke very eloquently about this. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, if we knew then what we know now, Reagan probably would have not have made that deal. In fact, Ed Meese has said, you know, Ed's still with us, sure. you know, the immigration didn't start roiling up until after Reagan fell ill before he died in you know, 2000. And Ed Meese said, you know, we were double crossed. We never got the border enforcement. We never got the employment uh, and hiring enforcement we were promised. Uh, uh, for giving amnesty to a million to three million uh, illegal immigrants. And uh, if we had known we weren't going to, that we were going to get double crossed, we wouldn't have made that deal. So, and, and Ed Meese told me that, I don't know, 10 years ago now, perhaps, even before Trump came along and really highlighted the issue so much. Um, so, you know, the politics of it were very different. And although we can look back now and say, yeah, that was not a very good deal, um, I think it shouldn't be overweighted. I think it made some sense at the time. And, and, and certainly was consistent with, you know, kind of President Reagan's outlook and his view of America and, 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 and kind of it, it enriches the country with, with people coming to, you know, through, through you know, immigration. And um, that, you know, has great lines about how people only come to the United States and people don't leave, you know, a place where you have freedom and democracy and those values, which is, you know, obviously the, 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 the critique of, of communism. Um, you know, the, the other piece that was so interesting is, and this is coming out now, is that there seems to be this narrative out there that somehow Reagan was establishment, right? And and and, and Trump is, is the populist and all those who are looking to contrast, you know, uh, uh, Reagan with Trump, they, they, they're, they're missing your, your first volume, which seems to kind of outline, you know, uh, the, the populist su- almost support for Reagan, whether he was a populist himself, we could discuss, but, you know, he really had... Uh, he was not established by any stretch going into his presence. Well, I, it, I think it's important to add that something Reagan said a lot, especially as governor of California, but he still said it also as president, is that, I forget exactly how he put it, but he always said, I think of myself and my team, we think of ourselves as part of we the people. In other words, not we the rulers. Uh, he, he would suggest in very gentle language that he still regarded government as a, often an alien force. And that even though he was in government and running the government, he still stood with the citizens against the excesses of government. And boy, he was really good at that, better than uh, really anybody else has ever been. And, you know, a lot of Republicans, uh, never mind Democrats, but a lot of Republicans don't ever talk or think that way very clearly. Um, Was that playing the outsider game? Basically, you know, kind of, you know, pushing back against Washington. I mean, he certainly uh, did that up until the time he was elected president, uh, calling for smaller government and gov- government being uh, essentially the, 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 the block against your, your freedom and, 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 and certainly limiting it. Right. And I think it's actually important to point out that since the 70s, really starting with Jimmy Carter, but maybe even earlier in some ways, uh, the candidates who win in both parties tend to win as outsiders running against Washington. That was Jimmy Carter. That was Bill Clinton. Uh, in uh, 92, uh, that, you know, and that's why governors tend to make the best candidates. And even Barack Obama, though he was a senator, he very much gave off the vibe that he didn't, wasn't happy with the Senate. He wanted to run against Washington also. And that explains Donald Trump, I think, by the way. And so the point there is not so much necessarily a partisan one, uh, but that there are a lot of voters out there up for grabs who are discontented with the way our life has been centralized in Washington and they rally to candidates who say, I'm not from Washington and I'm gonna go in there and kick them in the rear end. And Reagan but, 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 but in President Reagan's case, it really, I mean, it, you know, you could say it's a kind of a cynical uh, kind of play in order to, to get elected, but it was truly uh, ideological on his part for, for, for decades. Oh, right, Reagan really meant it. You know, Bill Clinton <laughs> didn't, you know, right? I mean, you know, 
know, my, my, my favorite joke about Bill Clinton is that speech where he said the era of big government is over. And then he went on for another hour about 101 new things big government could do for you. <laughs> um, but I want to go back to the populism piece because I want to really tease out in your mind how much being a president, you know, and, and, and the kind of the strain of populism, uh, you know, the Reagan revolution that propelled President Reagan to office, how much of that is tied to particular policies? Because, you know, you talk about President Reagan, he came in with a platform of peace through strength, a platform of, you know, morality and foreign policy, certainly celebrated immigration, right? Those are just three examples where uh, certainly uh, you look at today and say those those would be ways to you know to to be a kind of an establishment candidate and alienate any hope of of kind of populist support. Yeah, so you know uh, classically you define populism as the people against uh, the elites or concentrated interests that rule in their own benefit and uh, against the interests of the rest of us. And so populism, when you first examine it in American politics, is against really the moneyed interest. It's against Wall Street. It's against big business. And, you know, by degrees, as government, as centralized government has gotten bigger and more intrusive and often counterproductive, which we saw with inflation in the 70s, for example, uh, the, the uh, populist energy in this country is more and more against government and people allied with government. It can be crony industries and so forth. And that, again, is why, you know, Trump was so brilliant in exploiting that. But Reagan was really the first person. You know, he used language that uh, in certain ways, sounds like Trump, uh, you know, a little bit more artful, maybe. But he talked about in the 70s, there's a prairie fire about to sweep this country. You know, people are going to say no to more and more government power that, that uh, is uh, you know, counterproductive. And we're going to fix all that and make it run better. Uh, Trump's was a little angrier, of course. Um, but he, but And some of his populism sounded almost like left-wing populism, like when he sure. told the auto executives in Detroit that if you keep building your cars overseas, I'm going to slap a 30% tariff on them. Uh, Reagan didn't do that, although he did have a few compromises to help out the auto industry and the American steel industry, mostly because he was trying to stave off wider protectionist measures that he thought were counterproductive. But that's a that's an out, long and interesting story. Yeah, well, that's, that gets to some of the pragmatism, which you write on regularly in terms of those who want to kind of characterize President Reagan as, as a pragmatist and, and, and tend to water down kind of uh, Reagan as, as an ideologue. But before we get there, you know, you put your finger on this big government language and, and, and how uh, kind of, you know, you explain what populism is. And, and what's, what's quite interesting is, that, of course, very clear from the time of the time for choosing speech and throughout his presidency, whether he effectuated it or not, in terms of reducing the size of government, it was very clear where President Reagan stood vis-a-vis -vis big government. That's bad. You want to make government small. Uh, and the epoch of Reagan, which some argue is now uh, concluded with the rise of Trumpism, you know, that's a real contrast point because President Trump uh, is certainly not somebody who's against big government by any stretch. And then you have a lot of conservative or uh, uh, intellectuals who are talking about really um, American people aren't against big government anymore. In fact, they want government and they need government to help uh, solve problems. And, and, and those are some of the arguments intellectuals are making where perhaps the era of Reagan is behind us, at least with respect to that point on, on the size of government and, its, and the kind of view conservatives should take towards it. What's your response to some of those points? I think there's two things, two big things to look at. On the one hand, uh, it's certainly true that on certain policy areas, you see a night and day difference between Reagan and what's happening under Trump. Uh, you know, Reagan, well, it's a complicated story. But Reagan was always open to try and limit entitlement spending growth. And Trump has said, I'm not touching Social Security and Medicare, which is fiscally ruinous in the long term. And, you know, that the old Reaganite view that we need to control spending, that kind of left town along with Paul Ryan two years ago, I'm afraid. Um, and certain other things you can point to. On the other hand, the Trump administration is more Reaganite than Reagan in certain ways. And mm. the key one is this. Uh, Reagan understood very clearly that one of the problems with bureaucratic government was not simply that it's inefficient and wasteful and stifles economic growth, but that increasingly what we, what political scientists call the administrative state represents an unaccountable fourth branch of government that increasingly rules us by bureaucratic decree without our consent. Reagan even used that language in his first inaugural address that we're increasingly being governed without our consent, that language from the Declaration of Independence. 
Now, it's a long and tangled story. Reagan tried to fight against it. He won some, he lost some. And the Trump administration, I think they learned from the, uh, I won't say mistakes, but things that the Reagan administration didn't succeed at doing and have been much more aggressive in trying to reestablish old fashioned constitutional government. And for that, I'm very enthusiastic about what they've done. And uh, to that extent, they are carrying on the legacy of Reagan, I think in a very robust and salutary way. So um, it's interesting, um, you know, the, the piece of, I think it was the Ronald Nadal, the one in Claremont, review of books, where you, you opine for a moment on this kind of counterfactual, what if President Reagan uh, didn't have to uh, carry, you know, deal with the Soviet Union, employ a Cold War strategy, which you know was successful with the Reagan military buildup, and could have used those resources and energies towards doing just what you described, right, which is uh, shrinking the administrative state. Tell me more about kind of your thinking on that. It's fun to have someone, a, a biographer, explore a counterfactual. That kind of provoked me a bit. Well, I mean, there's two things to think about. One is, uh, you know, Reagan himself said after he left office that his biggest uh, disappointment was not being able to control spending better because spending kept growing. On the other hand, now we have another 30 years to tack on the Reagan years. And it turns out he was the most successful president in restraining spending growth of any post-World War II president. So he looks really good by comparison. But on measured his own, by, he, just slow down there, measured by restraining growth. Yes, right. That's very Washington. What's that? <laughs> That's very Washington. Restraining growth, you get credit for not growing too fast. Well, yeah, although, you know, again, this is Reagan's sort of prudence and realism. He used to say, Marty Anderson always said, Reagan would say, the problem is our budget grows like this, and we need to grow like this. So he knew that government would grow along with our economy and population, but he didn't want to grow bigger than the economy and population growth. And he came pretty close to holding the line. But on those budget fights, his top priority was, was building up our defenses to win the Cold War. And he said at the time to people, look, if I have to tolerate a deficit to get a defense budget that we need, then I'll tolerate a deficit. And an awful lot of the annual budget fights were Reagan wanting X for defense, but also restraining domestic spending. And the Democrats saying, because they controlled the House all eight years Reagan was president, he never had a House that he controlled or had his Republicans controlled. And, you know, they'd say, well, we're not going to give you your defense budget unless you give us this much more for our domestic spending. Now you want to draw back, I think, and the second point is, is think about Franklin Roosevelt for a minute. That's the president Reagan was often compared to. And, admired. And, and, and admired, absolutely. And of course, what do we know about Roosevelt? He had his domestic uh, legacy and his foreign policy legacy separate. He had two whole terms to cement the New Deal, and then he, then he got to win World War II. Reagan had to come in and win a Cold War, and my thought experiment is, suppose he was purely a peacetime president. There was no Soviet Union. There was no need for big defense budgets and, and all the time and attention that went into that dramatic story. What if Reagan had spent all eight years focused solely on his Reaganite view of what the domestic economy and domestic government should look like? With his persuasive skills and all the rest, I think he would have accomplished a lot more than he did. And he accomplished a lot. I mean, I do have some credit. My observations are things that didn't work out the way he'd hoped often through no fault of his own, and they, they tried very hard, and we learned from all that, but he did succeed a lot in revitalizing the economy and lots of other things. So, I mean, even on domestic policy, I think he was a very successful president. But you also note in, in, in this piece um, where the tactics were, are, were quite different, and we we're talking about President Reagan's character, the humility, right, the, the ability to engage, and, and, and you say at some points, that it worked against him, uh, not taking on uh, the Fed with Volcker, or, um, you know, you give another example where President Reagan just, you know, just di didn't want to, didn't want to fight. And you st is it your view that he could have done both? He could have had his cake and eat it too, if he would have adopted a more kind of, I think he's a more pugilist, pugilistic approach. Well, I mean, it, the, the one place where I think he really should have been more, uh, put a much bigger fight was the Robert Bork nomination. Yeah. But even in the middle of that, as I, and I remember that vividly, even in the middle of that, as you could see this all going wrong, it really wasn't clear that what was happening is the rules of the game had completely changed right then in real time. I mean, we've seen it now with the recent Supreme Court flights, fights, is that when, uh, especially when a Republican president nominates somebody, they're ready to go to battle to defend that person. 
And the Reagan White House was too slow to perceive that the rules had suddenly changed. And so that's one, but other ones, you know, you take it case by case and you don't want to understand it too much from hindsight. Uh, you know, we, we understand it more clearly now looking back than someone at the time. So I don't actually fault Reagan for not criticizing Volcker. I think that was actually probably generally correct, although you could have criticized certain aspects of the way that Fed was uh, um, organizing monetary policy that were suboptimal. Um, the budget fights he could have, I think we learned from subsequent budget fights in the Clinton years that the president has a stronger position than Reagan sure. bought. Uh, so, you know, you live and learn with some of these things, right? Um, so, and, uh, let's talk about the budget fights because one of the things that fascinates me, and it seems to be in your mind, it was inevitable that uh, Reagan's uh, budget director, David Stockman, was, was never gonna prevail in his fights with his, uh, Reagan's Secretary of Defense, Casper Weinberg, because Reagan w was out there on the subject and, and you know, he was always going to lean towards whatever strength required. You know, and that generally be what his Secretary of Defense and generals uh, wanted. Do I have that right or was it actually more of an open question? No, no, I think you have that exactly right. And, and to restate what I was trying to get at a minute ago is Reagan was very good at having a hierarchy of priorities. And so, you know, coming into office, you know, he said, and his top team said, we have two things we have to pay attention to, um, getting our foreign policy back in order. And that was going to take time because you don't just say we're going to be tough on the Soviet Union without having the means to do it and mm -hmm. changing lots of things at the margin and then being patient. Uh, and then also they said, if we don't get our economy going again, we're not going to be able to do anything in foreign policy or anywhere else. So the economy was priority one. Uh, and at the same time, they were thinking very seriously about how they reorient foreign policy for the long term. So let me, let, let's move to free trade. We were hitting on that a, a moment ago. Uh, that would be a contrast point between uh, the kind of populist train today and, and elements of uh, President Trump and, and his administration. Um, you know, of course, you noted just as well that when it came to Japan, right, there was, there was a certain uh, openness to his protectionism, and it wasn't you know, uh, kind of the pure free trade that uh, people, Republicans, you know, establishment uh, certainly advocate today. Um, how pure free trader uh, was President Reagan? And um, certainly when it, when it came to dealing with, you know, a Soviet Union or like today dealing with, uh, you know, China and, 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 and that closed state, you know, free, free trade, obviously, uh, you know, it wouldn't be something that um, would need some sort of adjustment. Yeah. So I think uh, four quick points. One is on the level of principle, Reagan was a firm free trader. He believed in the logic of free trade. And, you know, NAFTA was really his idea. and He got NAFTA started. That's point number one. Point number two is something people forget today, which was throughout Reagan's entire two terms, there was a bipartisan majority in Congress in favor of trade protectionism. And people now have completely forgotten that Reagan vetoed, especially in the second term, some protectionist measures that passed Congress. Uh, so he tried to hold the line against much more restrictive trade uh, um, policies that came out of Congress and that business lobbied for. And so point three is he would make some concessions. Um, you mentioned the Japanese auto imports. You know, there was all kinds of support for putting restrictions on Japanese imports. So Reagan got with the Japanese uh, government and their auto companies and said, things will go better for both of us if you agree to some voluntary restraints, which had the same effect as right. trade tariffs. Uh, that actually, I think, worked to the advantage of Japanese auto companies because they made a move to luxury cars sooner than they might otherwise, but leave that aside for the moment. Interesting. And the last thing I'll say about our current moment, though, to bring us right up to now is, you know, Trump in many ways, and this is one of them, may represent a reversion to the old fashioned Republican mean. Uh, the Republican Party was historically the more isolationist party, even as recently as Bob Taft back in the 50s. Yes. And also Republican Party in the 19th century was a party of trade protectionism. Uh, you know, Lincoln was certainly a protectionist and it was the Democrats who were the free trade party in the early 20th century. Then the parties kind of switched places and now maybe we're going back. And so Trump may represent not so much a, 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 a you know, a complete disruptor. I mean, he is that <laughs> in general, but he may represent a, a reversion to the sort of legacy and traditions of the Republican Party that were distorted partly by the Cold War. And the other area, and I'll stop, sorry, I'm going on too long. No, it's good. You know, Trump's non-interventionism or his neo-isolationism, if you want. 
that's also the Republican Party's uh, DNA from you know before World War II, and even as I say after World War II to some extent. Yeah, I mean, I want to get to the internationalism and 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 the role of uh, of the U.S. in the world uh, next. But uh, you know, it strikes me the free trade piece for President Reagan. You noted how the you know, Congress is oriented towards more protectionism. It was fundamentally not, and it wasn't the end. Wasn't free trade? It was a means towards an ends of economic growth. Uh, yes. Similarly, with with the innovation that you know he looked and celebrated Silicon Valley. Now that sounds kind of like as an establishment, you know, support of, of, of the tech barons. But at the time, it was the means towards not only prevailing against the Soviet Union, but the innovation that President Reagan viewed as being kind of the heart of what makes this country great, get the government out of the way and let entrepreneurs be entrepreneurs. Um, you know, there's some context there uh, that perhaps is not appreciated is if you want to make the kind of the crude Silicon Valley, yes, supported, Trump doesn't support now. It's, it's about the end state. And the end state was about, American growth and American innovation, correct? Yeah, well, I mean, remember that, you know, Reagan, when Reagan's governor and then in the 80s as president, California was really one of these centers of innovation and two industries were joined together, the defense industry, mm -hmm. uh, which innovated like crazy, uh, and high tech, which, uh, you know, Reagan understood that you weren't going to be able to have missile defense, his famous strategic defense initiative, without a lot of input from the high tech industry. Now that again, that's more than 30 years in the rearview mirror now because the defense industry has gone from California for a whole bunch of reasons. And then the what you know the tech industry in the last 10, 15 years has moved sharply left. <laughs> I, I like to joke that I wish these billionaires were both Republican like they're supposed to. <laughs> they're all liberal Democrats. <laughs> so, but but the, the point though, Silicon Valley is is kind of, to the extent that it's a means in, in, to innovation and, and, and American you know, prosperity, then that is something worth investing in, right? I mean, that is, that is worth supporting. I guess, I guess that, you know, the, the, let's get to the point now about whether we're past, in your view, the, Re, you know, the, the, the epoch of President Reagan, right? In the same way that the election, I don't know, of, of, of Bill Clinton was uh, represented the end of, of, of New Deal, you know, New, New Dealism amongst uh, Democrats. Is it because, you know, to me, is it because those particular policies are, are, are have changed, or do you feel that the actual principles and beliefs uh, have, have have changed? You know, all that's up for grabs right now. Um, you know, on this trade business, my thought experiment here is, and again, we can't know how this would work, but I think my own opinion is that an awful lot of the trade problem now is really a China problem. You know, they've behaved with the mercantilist predatory policies and, and massive theft of intellectual property. The bother's not just us, but also all of Europe, too. And, and we, we, you know, Trump takes it out on NAFTA and on Mexico, and I don't think that's where the problem is. I think it's a China problem. Uh, now, having said that, the other part of this is we're not happy with results, whether that view is true or not. We're not happy with the fact that we've lost too much manufacturing. Uh, upward mobility for unskilled labor seems to be very limited these days. And so we're casting around thinking, we've got to figure out some way of trying to recover that kind of economy that we used to have. And lo and behold, to me, one of the greatest surprises is all the conservatives running around these days sounding like Walter Mondale from 1984. You know, Mondale <laughs> wanted industrial policy. And right. Reagan and all the conservatives then were dead set against it. This is just the government putting their finger on the scale and they'll make a mess of things. Uh, and now, uh, you know, you have people saying, I mean, I, I asked Tucker Carlson this, uh, you know, smart guy, as we all know. I said, was Ross Perot right about NAFTA? And he said, oh, absolutely he was right about NAFTA, which I, <laughs> I quarrel with some. But then, but the day, I have, I'm, I'm hesitant to ask the next question was, so Walter Mondale was right about industrial policy? Oh, you shouldn't have held off. That would have been the perfect question. I know. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, next time. Next, but you know, you, you mentioned in this is the first time we've gone to you know some I don't know half hour into our conversation. China really does change things, right? And and the, the set of rules for you know kind of what used to be called you know Western economies. Right now, you have you know the open market system. Yes, there is, you should you know free trade is the best way to you know realize your comparative advantage and all sides can prosper. But when you're dealing with China. Right, communist uh, country. You have, you have the Chinese Communist Party that, again, is not playing by the same rules. Right, then all of a sudden the 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 the, the pure free trade is working against us, and that's the point 
that is not only coming out of the Trump administration. I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty much consensus amongst political leaders, the divisions over kind of the tactics we should employ. Um, but you know, to the extent this is about China, free trade, of course, is something that needs to be revisited as it relates to the Chinese Communist Party. Well, you know, in the, in the during during the years of the Cold War, we never wanted to have too much trade with the Soviet Union because it would build them up. I mean, the the kind of trade Reagan liked was the kind of cost them money, you know, selling them wheat, uh, and then not helping them build gas pipelines so they'd get hard currency. Okay, that's a fun part of that story. <laughs> the problem that we're having with China is, I think we, I don't know if you say we were lear- not learned the wrong lesson, but the lesson we got out of the end of the Cold War, we thought would apply to China, which is economic liberalization would lead You know, we added them in 2001 to the World Trade Organization and thought they'd become a more normal country, that they'd become more democratic, the way the Soviet Union, after it broke up, became somewhat more democratic. You're, you know, that's another story for another day, but... right. Uh, it was a happy outcome, and we thought the same thing was likely to happen with China. Well, it well, happened in other, other countries in Asia, right? Exactly, and it has not happened with China. In fact, it's arguably going the other direction. The Chinese want the fruits of economic liberalization, uh, but are absolutely determined not to go the way of the Soviet Union, I think. I think they saw what happened in the Soviet Union and said, we don't want that. We're going to make No doubt. They've been studying it, for sure. Right. Very tight now. And then the, the final one is, is you know, China may be a military menace. They're growing all the time, but they're not an ideological menace. They're not, you know, they're not trying to spread revolution around the world the way uh, the Soviet Union and the communist world did for, you know, 75 years. Uh, And so it's a little trickier uh, than it was with the Soviet Union. People call this now Cold War II, and it's kind of that on the military level, but not on the ideological one. So this well, is I think, I, you know, there, that's definitely that's definitely an area of debate. I mean, I think I think the manner in which they spread their ideology is not, you know, uh, the same way the Soviet Union did. Um, but I think I definitely think that there there's a view out there that, you know, President Xi and the Chinese Communist Party uh, are exporting and advancing their interest, exporting ideology, uh, maybe not you know, the, the pure kind of uh, communist Leninist ideology, but their own version uh, and certainly economically, uh, they're advancing their interests in a pretty aggressive fashion, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. To, to, to me, it's a, the open question, and I'm curious is, is, to get your take, is, you know, the debates we saw in the, in the 60s and 70s, you know, amongst conservatives, you know, uh, you, know you had a Kissingerian uh, approach to detente and, uh, and letting the two systems exist, uh, whether or not you know conservatives will weigh in on that in terms of what, what the outcome they're seeking to achieve, uh, we ought to achieve with respect to, to the Chinese Communist Party. You know, is this simply something that's economic, uh, and and or is it or is it something uh, kind of like you mentioned uh, across the military, economic, and uh, political realm where it's where it's where it's rhyming with the Cold War? Yeah, you know, I mean, back during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, we, we debated a lot whether cultural exchanges were going to help undermine the Soviet Union by, you know, insinuating, uh, you know, Western ideas. I, I like to joke sometimes that blue jeans brought down the Soviet Union, and there's an element of truth to that. Right. Uh, and so nowadays, I, I go back and forth on this. You know, we have so many students coming to America from mainland China, and I, I sometimes I think, well, that's bad if they learn our terrible ideas, political, you know, the crazy uh, campus ideas these days and take them back to China, although that may wreck the country. You know, we used to say we could hobble Japan if we sent them a whole bunch of lawyers, right? <laughs> 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 uh, on the other hand, and a lot of Chinese students are here to be engineers too, and okay. Um, and, you know, I try to keep up with this. Uh, you know, they, Chinese, Chinese universities like to have the European and American professors come and visit and I'm not sure we're sending our best, to borrow Trump's famous phrase. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm not sure that uh, China may, this might spin out of control for China, but it, it's mm. hard to know. Interesting. Uh, you know, how is it for you? Just change the subject from China, but you mentioned the world of the academy, uh, Ivory Tower. You, you are uh, a conservative, open, uh, you know, not, not afraid to, to share your, your political outlook. You, you, you write frequently about it. You, you're on TV and elsewhere, uh, how is it being an academic uh, on campuses uh, with, you know, with your outlook? I mean, I, people know what they're getting and therefore it doesn't impact you with the quote unquote cancel culture. 
Well, I mean, it has a little bit, but that's a long story. Uh, first of all, I'm an older guy now, and I don't really care. They can toss me out, and I'll, I've got other things I can do. <laughs> I think it's very difficult. Well, I do think, though, second, that it's to your advantage, if you can, to be an open conservative. You know, a lot of conservatives who are in uh, academia, especially younger ones, really do think they have to conceal their views. And that may be getting worse, in fact, uh, and I can go through case studies, but I've decided that, you know, I'm going to let my pirate flag fly. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's to my advantage. And I have to say, um, you know, I, I joke sometimes that I'm an inmate right now at UC Berkeley, and I sit in on all kinds of things that I scratch my head and think, uh, this is really crazy. And it's, so I joke that it's opposition research. Um, <laughs> but uh, to, to what extent uh, do you have students coming to you and, uh, you know, in Berkeley and elsewhere. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, not reflected in the headlines that, that truly yeah. there is, there is a, you know, a large number or a significant number who, who are, you know, coming in and, and, uh, you know, sure, willing to listen more than they're willing to just kind of lecture. Oh, there's quite a lot of that. I mean, my, my experience at Berkeley and also a couple other places I've been is that conservative students are thrilled that they can take a class where their views won't be mocked which really happens an amazing amount. Uh, and then I get quite a lot of liberal and even pretty progressive students who come to my, uh, sign up for my classes because they actually want to hear something different. Mm. They won't argue with me. And they're usually, at Berkeley, they're really smart students and it makes for a great, great classroom. And so I think one of the things that these universities that have become such monocultures uh, don't understand is that they are narrowing their intellectual life uh, and I think they're impoverishing your students. I love my progressive students. They're great fun in class, and they have a good time hearing something different. So, you know, Ju so Justice cool. Scalia was famous for always having at least one clerk who disagreed right. with his outlook, and I think that that enriches all sides. So um, we got only a few minutes left. We're going to get to our, our, our Reagan uh, lightning round in just a minute, but I do want to explore this topic of kind of Reagan and the internationalist someone who certainly uh, had a, promoted freedom and democracy uh, across the globe, um, uh, you know, and, and to the extent that you feel that that is not in sync with uh, where conservatives are either today or maybe Reagan was the anomaly talking about the more, you know, isolationist uh, elements in, in the Republican Party. So a few words on that and to what extent um, Reagan was the exception, not the rule. And then I want to talk about alliances and particularly I know you've been doing some uh, reading and writing on on Margaret Thatcher, of course, that was the special relationship and the relationship uh, that President Reagan had that really was key to her, to achieving you know the end of the Cold War. Yeah. So let's see. Well, the first part was uh, sort of Reagan's internationalism. Is that yeah? And to accept yeah. that's the exception, not the rule. Yeah. I don't know that he's an exception uh, really, except that he was under the extraordinary. I, I, I hate to call it a crisis because it lasted forty some years with the Cold War, right? You know, the Cold War changed everything, um, and that compelled uh, any statesman to be more internationalist than they might otherwise have been inclined to be. But I think Reagan, I think Reagan was actually closest to that famous remark of John Quincy Adams, who remember said in 1820 something that America is a friend of liberty everywhere, but an offender only of our own. And one of the things we learned about Reagan subsequently is that he was very averse to using force. He was not this reckless cowboy that his critics and enemies made him out to be. Uh, just to give one example, uh, you know, late in his term in 1988, uh, our foreign policy establishment had come to the conclusion that we need to get rid of General Nor uh, Noriega in Panama. He was a bad guy dealing drugs and causing lots of problems. And Reagan said, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, you know, Bush can do it if he wants to do it, if he succeeds me. Uh, he always ruled out sending American troops into Nicaragua. He would never say that publicly, by the way. He always wanted them to worry about it, which any sure. practical statesman would do. But privately, he said, I'm not sending troops down there. That's not the main fight. He was prepared to uh, you know, go to war with the Soviet Union if it came to it, but he really didn't want to. Um, and I think, you know, that uh, contrasts with residents of other parties who I think have been more willing to intervene. Um, and so the whole international patchwork of things that we had in the Cold War, which, again, your thought experiment is, would we have had NATO and all these other things that we had in the Soviet Union? Probably not. Um, uh, but I, I think, as I say, I think Reagan was sort of a John Quincy Adams. Um, Interesting. Um, that, that, we'll have to come back another time and have that discussion because... Yeah, you know, on the one hand, he, he did not want to put boots on the ground unless it was an absolute necessity. And then on the other hand, did feel that 
the American leadership in the world was was essential, and, and, and alliances were a key part of it. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the peace through strength actually made lots of sense in the short phrase, right? Uh, right. You know, he certainly believed in, you know, if you have a really strong defense, no one will mess with you. And that yeah, was, yeah. Was what, what about Thatcher and the work you're doing on Thatcher? Well, I just, uh, I mean, I'm not really intensively studying her. I just uh, had the delight of reading the three volume biography by Charles Moore. And, uh, and boy, is that a magnificent survey of that. If you're interested in Thatcher, it's worth the time to read all three volumes. I mean, they're very detailed, get into lots of things Americans wouldn't be interested in, but you can skip over some parts of that. <laughs> And I think it ratifies a couple of things. You know, Winston Churchill said as one of the, I think his final cabinet meeting as prime minister in 1955, Churchill said to a successor, Anthony Eden and all the people around the table, never get separated from the Americans. And he didn't just mean that as a matter of self-interest. He, he believed that as a matter of principle and mm -hmm. you know, the shared special relationship based on being English speaking. English speaking people. Yeah. Right, exactly. And Thatcher thought much the same thing. And you know, she had some disagreements with Reagan and some clashes over things. Uh, but in general, that was a magnificent partnership. Do you feel the pressure to write a third volume on Reagan now that you got three volumes on Thatcher? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I thought about going back and revisiting things, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> it was so much fun. It's all would be almost too hard to go back and do it now. But well, you know. if I could, if I'm looking at, at your, your wonderful shirt there, it seems to be you have nostalgic for the Reagan Library. You need to go back there and spend more time with the original research, huh? Well, I might because, of course, you know, I finished writing that book now 11, 12 years ago. I finished writing in 2008, the second volume, and more documents have been declassified and released and organized. And so there's probably a lot more to look at. And, and someday maybe I'll do that. All right. Well, let's let's go to our lightning round. We would love to have you back uh, at the Reagan Library. And, and, and if you're in Washington, visit us here at the at the Institute. Uh, but before we let you go, uh, give us your favorite book on President Reagan, your favorite speech by President Reagan and your favorite quote by President Reagan. Uh, I'm not going to let you choose your own book because that will be as much fun. Of course. No, I wouldn't do it anyway. I, I like Reagan's modesty in that regard. Uh, it's hard to pick just one. Um, I actually think um, I, I like, pick any one of those collections of Reagan's original writings, uh, Reagan in his own hand, I mm -hmm. think uh, that Martin Anderson and um, Kyron Skinner and Annalise Anderson put together. They have a second volume, which uh, I forget the, the uh, I forget the title of the second volume because they went back and found more of them. Right. Uh, I think those are a thing to read. Um, I'll, I can read really off too many Reagan books. So I, I think that's why I tell people, read the man himself. Read the man himself. Okay, good. Uh, well, the second one was um, speech. Speech. You know, it, uh, that's also very tough. It's either, I'm going to name two, sorry. It's either the time for choosing speech that mm -hmm. started him off at 64 or his farewell address, which I think is a very remarkable. So you go for the bookends, the beginning and the end, huh? That's right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a lot in the middle. Uh, first inaugural <laughs> address is pretty important, too. And then finally, the last one, oh, favorite quote. Um, yeah. Here I'm torn between two very short ones. One is, uh, which is useful at any time, is when government expands, liberty contracts. Mm -hmm. I call that Reagan's razor, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then and the, the, the one that you pair it with is his remark that freedom is only one generation away from being lost. I think that's how that goes. Yeah. And here we are now, a little more than 30 years from Reagan departing the scene as president, and look where we are. We'll leave it at that. Dr. Stephen Hayward, what a wonderful opportunity for us to, to chat with you about President Reagan, the subject of your two-volume biography. Uh, thanks for being on the show. We look forward to, forward to having you back in the not-too-distant future. Yeah, hopefully we can do this in person together in Washington next time. That would be great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, we hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.